Hello and welcome to today's event, Winning at Email Marketing in 2022. We've got an amazing event for you today with lots of great content speakers and really to help you win at email. So let me introduce the speakers. My name is Pierce Eugene Walla. I'm the co-founder and CEO here at NAC. I'm a lifetime marketer and I love email. I'm also joined by a group of amazing email marketing experts. We've got two of our customers, uh, Stacy Zur from Walter Skluer and John Wright from SNHU. And they're both going to be sharing their stories about what they're doing for email at their companies. We also have a special guest, Mike Rizzo is here from MoPros. He's gonna be sharing some initial findings from his State of MoPros research study that's gonna be coming out shortly, specifically about how it relates to email. And last but not least, we've got my colleague here, Brendan. He's uh, our co-founder and COO, working with our customers every day um, Brendan has also been in marketing operations for a long time and used to lead marketing ops at Trend Micro. So this is a little bit of a roadmap for our event today. Uh, we've got a lot of great content. We're going to keep it quick and fast um, and try and make it as interactive as possible. We want to leave room for questions at the end. If you have questions at any time, please add it to the question uh, area below and we'll try our best to get to them at the end of the event. I know probably our first question will be, is this event being recorded and will we get the slides? And the answer is yes to both of those. So what is winning? How do you win? How can you be flying in some place with palm trees like Zach Galifianakis says? Um, let's just level set here and talk about what that means. And I think really for us, what winning at email marketing is all about is how can you send communications that your audience wants to receive and is actively engaging in those that drive revenue and pipeline. So we're gonna get more into that a little bit later, but first let's take a look at, at a macro level, what's going on with email. I'm sure all of us out there have seen, people have been saying email is dead forever. For years people have saying that, or that Slack is coming, but the reality is there is more email being sent out than ever before, and that trend is continuing forward. Um, and based on our benchmark, we saw that 71% of marketers said that they sent more email in 2021 than they did before. But let's be honest, everybody, the world is changing. You have social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram stories and YouTube shorts. And what that is doing is, is really crushing all of our attention spans. The, this study came out that shows actually that humans now have the same attention span as a goldfish, uh, which is like less than 10 seconds. So, you know, people are distracted. How do we get them to engage? Uh, Everyone who knows me knows I'm a big Silicon Valley fan. So anytime I can get a slide in with, with Gavin Belson, I try to. But the reality for us marketers is that big tech is making our lives a bit more complicated, right? Apple Mail has introduced some new changes this year that are going to limit how much open rate data we have. Spam filters are getting better. There's tabs in Gmail. There is challenges, but you know what? We are marketers. This is nothing new to us. We are constantly evolving and finding new ways to break through. And in fact, that is exactly what we're doing. Email marketing has the best returns across any channel. Um, in this recent study, it showed that for every dollar invested into email marketing, 
people were earning $36 on that dollar. We can see it compared to other channels. Email is still very, very effective. Anne Hanley is one of my favorite marketers. You know, I grew up reading her books. We actually just had her on a recent event and she has one of the best email newsletters out there. If you haven't already subscribed, I'd really encourage you to do that. Uh, but she, she was saying, you know, email is really one of the last channels where you are in control of who receives your messages, right? Any of these social networks, there are algorithms in between you and the people that you are trying to get your message to. In our own research, we saw that marketers increased their click-through rates by 44% in the last year. So if we look at all of this, there is more emails than ever being sent. People have smaller attention spans than ever. But marketers are finding a way to continue to engage their audience and drive revenue through the email channel. So how are they doing it? And this is exactly why we do our email benchmark study every year. We really put a lot of time and effort into serving thousands of marketers to understand what are they doing for email how are they evolving? How are they building? How are they designing? How are they collaborating to make amazing emails that stand out and break through? And in the past four years of doing these benchmarks, along with working with thousands of different customers, we really think that this really boils down what success is, is boils down to two X factors. So the first one being speed. So the marketers that are able to create emails with speed are able to save time. And what they can do with that time is be much more strategic in their email efforts. They're able to test, they're able to optimize, they're able to look at data and they are able to be more strategic with what they're doing. The second element is creativity. So in order to, to stand out, to cut through, to engage with your audience, you need to be creative. And the best marketers are finding ways to inject creativity into their emails to really break through. Now, these two elements are kind of like putting two magnets together. They don't, they don't necessarily go together. But what we're finding is the best marketers are finding ways to make, to bring speed and creativity together. So as we go through today's event, I would encourage everybody to think about your own email creation process and look at ways that areas for improvement around finding speed and injecting creativity into that process. And that's where we find the real magic and keys to success. So to be successful and to constantly improve, you need to know some benchmarks. How are other companies doing so that you can measure yourself? So I want to share with everybody the benchmarks that we had for this year. So when we look at deliverability rates, so how many emails are getting to your uh, audience's inbox, we saw that at 93% this year. We talked a little bit about click-through rates with Apple Mail, so, uh, but click uh, open rate was at 24% this year. Click-through rate at 10% up almost four and a half percent from last year and the unsubscribe rate at 0.3 percent we know that we have a lot of large customers on the event today so we wanted to show as well how these look depending on how many how big your company is as well so I think I, one thing that I would like to comment on is open rate. We know that this metric is changing. I think 
you're not going to want to compare what your open rate is this year compared to last year because Apple has changed a lot of this. But I think what you want to do is use that open rate directionally to know how are your subject lines go, uh, doing. So to win, we need to know what are our challenges, where are our weaknesses uh, in order to improve? This is a question we asked in the benchmark study. And this is a question that I would like to pose to all of you. Um, so what is your greatest email challenge? We're going to hopefully see a poll coming up here that allows you to vote on your biggest email challenge. And we're going to talk through those. And as we wait for the votes to come in, uh, I'll pass things over to Brendan uh, to go through our next section here. Thanks, Pierce. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, while you guys are all filling in the polling uh, answers there uh, about what your what is your greatest email challenge, um, yeah, my name is Brendan. Uh, I'm also like Pierce, a, a career marketer, uh, and but unlike Pierce, I hate email. I never liked email as a marketer, but it was so important, it's such a huge part of my job, and I, I think I hated it because I didn't understand it. I, I couldn't do it myself. Uh, and uh, anyway, that that's uh, a little bit about me. Um, I hate email, but I love all of you. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at the, the findings from the report here. Uh, it looks like, wow, focusing on strategic initiatives is number one on the list today here. And then creating and implementing new designs is, is number two challenge for everyone. That is really interesting. That is actually, you know, really um uh, looks a lot like our findings from the actual uh, our actual benchmark study where creating and implementing new designs was actually number one and then focusing on strategic operations was number two so um really uh really indicative of of what's uh what we came up with there that's really interesting so uh we're going to talk through both of those areas and more here in a second but um so what i want to start with is is how, how do you win at email? Well, the answer is simple. It's uh, chevrons, obviously, right? Uh, and, and some words on them, um, uh, only kidding. But uh, obviously, so we, we've come up with a bit of a, a roadmap here uh, for winning at email. And it starts with planning. Then we'll talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about creation. We're gonna talk about collaboration and what that has to do with email creation. And then we're gonna talk about winning and what that, what that looks like. Uh, and this is all based on our study results. Again, working with thousands of marketers and enterprises all over the world. Um, and this is what we're gonna go through here together today. So we're gonna start with the plan section. Uh, this section is all about how you can plan to win at email. Uh, and so we're going to go through three different areas here. Uh, one, how do you organize and structure your team? We asked uh, marketers about that. We're going to look at some of the results there. What approach are you taking to build emails? Uh, as well as what do you actually, like how, how do you actually build the emails themselves? Uh, and we're actually also going to talk uh, with Stacy here in this section uh, about how she and her team does that and, and really plans for winning. Uh, with email. So how are marketing teams structured? Uh, it looks like many marketing teams are centralized here. Uh, certainly it's the, the number one answer. But what's more interesting in this chart is uh, the, the decentralized and hybrid teams or some kind of uh, hybrid decentralized situation are really increasing in popularity. What, what I hear from a lot of marketing teams is that their goal is to empower their marketers to do more themselves. As an enterprise marketer myself, I remember wanting so bad to, you know, to, to own my own destiny for my own campaigns. I wanted to create and move at the speed that I, you know, that I wanted to work at uh, every day, and that that was that was tough back then. And, and look at this, when we ask uh, marketers who is actually designing emails, we're seeing more and more marketers 
are being empowered to design their own emails. Design is actually being democratized. Uh, and, and Pierce is going to talk a little bit about that in the create section as well. So now let's take a look at what is holding back marketers from being creative with email. Well, it looks like, again, you know, resources, skills, coding, those things are kind of the greatest obstacles to creativity uh, in email creation today. It's really interesting. And this, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. So how are marketers building emails today? So we can see here that templates are actually the top way marketing teams are building emails. But what is really interesting here is a big increase in usage of email creation platforms or campaign creation platforms for building emails. That uh, has gone up by quite a bit and actually is a, a, you know, quite a significant um, population of folks here using those. So really interesting to see. All right. And with that, I'm going to uh, welcome Stacy Zur uh, with, with me here. The, she's the Director of Digital Marketing at Walters Kluwer's Health. Uh, and we're going to talk, uh, Stacy, you and I are going to talk a little bit about how your team plans for winning at email uh, at, at a Fortune 500 company. So thanks for joining yeah. us, Stacey. Well, thank you so much for having me. Right on. So, so Stacey, tell me a little bit about about Walter Schooler Health and and a little bit about your team. Um, okay. Well, I'm so sorry. I've never seen this cat before in my life. I have no idea who he is. Um, so, you know, what's interesting about Walter Schooler and um, health specifically is that we focus on B two B and B two C, and we have a variety of stakeholders. We do a lot of work with societies. We do a lot of work with our product marketers. We do a lot of work with sales. So we really need to appeal to a wide variety of, of people. So, um, and we have a, an enormous volume of work that we have to put out. And so I think, um, you know, over the past 30 days, I think we've put out like 11 million emails. So wow. there's a lot of work to, to be had and we have a lot of strict guidelines and brand standards that we need to um, comply with, not just for us, but for with the societies that we work with. And we work in um, medicine and nursing and within both of those, we put out communications for um, medicine um, in administration and hospitals and institutions. We work with um, technology for nursing solutions. We work in education and then we work in practice. So we just, we have a variety of products for a variety of stakeholders and it's just complex. Wow. Yeah, that's wild. So, so Stacy, <laughs> tell me how, how do you set up your team for success? How, how do you win at email with your team? Well, I mean, I think that everybody on this call can appreciate efficiencies, especially when it comes to email. Um, you know, it's one thing to have a large strategy and to think like, this is what we'd like to do for the year. But at the end of the day, it's really important to make sure that you're getting the assets that you need to build what you need to build, right? And then to deploy. And so for us, we were finding a challenge in being efficient with our email builds because there was so much that went into it from the design to the copy to all of the different um, aspects, right? And we were spending an inordinate amount of time building the actual email when we really also needed to focus our energies on the campaign itself, right? So we were able to utilize templates and build out this phenomenal theme library and we use them um, in a way that is easy for my for the builders for my team, right? So it, they can easily put in copy, they could put in images. I don't want to say that they don't have to think, but they don't need. There's no guesswork in it. They are told the template to use, and they're able to build and then concentrate more on the campaign versus the design. And our designs are gorgeous, but it wasn't my email team that needed to worry about that. That was my creative team. And we were able to utilize Knack in that you don't have to have a developer to do it, and it, they're, they turn out wonderful. 
Excellent. That sounds that sounds amazing. Uh, and yeah. so, so are they are they all able to build the emails themselves? Then, Stacy, is that how that works? Yeah. And what's really nice is that we've got an in-house team of about five, and then I've got third-party contractors who come in to to help with the volume as well. It's really easier for me to spin up somebody who's new working in our environment because everything is already pre-made for them. They don't have to worry about creating new modules or creating any kind of like design themselves. Mm -hmm. We have 27 different templates for them to choose from and we do a variety of different communications, right? We've got newsletters, we've got webinars, we've got, you know, it's like a single product, we've got journals, we've got books. So for somebody who's just coming into our organization, right, it can be really overwhelming because they've got a task list that's, you know, huge. And it's already whenever you're spinning up into a new environment, it's like, what is this? So we make it really easy in that we've got this whole library for them to create from. And then what's even better about the templates is that when we bring them over to Marketo, they're in module form. So we can actually still utilize all of the great things that Marketo brings to the table, like personalization and dynamic content. Excellent. And so, so you're not actually, your marketers are not actually building in your marketing automation platform in Marketo. They're doing that outside. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do everything outside and then we sync over to Marketo. Awesome. And it was just, um, I think we made the decision to do that in 2017. I joined the organization last year, so they were already doing this when I came in. Um, and I've worked in in organizations that used Marketo to actually build the email. And there is something, um, I mean, you really do need a developer to jump in and create templates that are going to kind of, you know, work for you and your business needs and for us, we had so many different pieces and parts that needed to appeal to so many different stakeholders that being able to use something as robust as NAC it really worked out well for us. Excellent. <clears throat> that's exciting. That sounds great, Stacey. Yeah. Thank you so much. That, that's, that's great. You, it sounds like you, your team is, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine 11 million emails in 11 days or something. You said that is, <clears throat> that's nuts. Yeah. So um, we're tired. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. You, you got to be pretty efficient yeah. uh, in order to do that. So great, great stuff. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, it sounds like you really set your team up for success. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Right on. Great. Well, look, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and wrap that section. Um, so uh, the, the planning here. So, so just to wrap up the plan section here. Um, what we're seeing is more decentralized or hybrid teams are emerging at enterprises. Uh, and what we're seeing is that allows marketers to be more efficient, just like Stacy was talking about. They can move more quickly to build emails and create emails. Uh, design is being done by more than just designers. We saw that more folks, more marketers are actually doing designs themselves. Uh, and finally, Email creation platforms uh, are an increasingly popular way to create. You heard Stacy is using one certainly for her team. Uh, and that really helps to separate the creation from the execution, right? And that helps marketers not only be, be empowered to do things themselves, but of course to move faster as well. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Pierce to do the create section. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so yeah, so once you've actually planned out how you want to go about doing your emails, you actually do have to create them. Uh, and this is really an area that I'm very passionate about uh, and excited to take you take everyone through this. So uh, we're going to cover design, building, like how you actually make those emails. Anyone who's been an email knows that they can be difficult to build. And then we'll also talk about testing and optimization and i'm going to bring on john wright from snhu to talk about how they're really leveraging testing and optimization uh, to improve their email results so one of the first things we'll look at this is from the benchmark study is you know what are the different design elements that are used in email 
all of these are opportunities to really make your email stand out. So I'm not here advocating you go and do every one of these in your next email, but I think it is about looking at these elements and how you can incorporate some of them into your next email and, and finding those creative ways that are going to help you stand out and give your audience, you know, those little moments of delight that maybe they weren't expecting. Um, so we see a ton of personalization, personalization, dynamic content. I think the needs and the expectations of today's consumer is that they're getting content that was made for them, that's personalized to them. And so lots of marketers are using those. Background images, custom fonts are, are some others in there. But again, when you think about the creativity component, what are some of the things that you can use from this that maybe other marketers aren't? Um, honestly, I cannot believe in 2022 that we're still talking about responsive emails. I wish we didn't have to talk about this, but the reality is, this is still not being done by everyone. Um, and so, you know, if you're a marketer out there that is not doing responsives yet, or maybe there's someone in your company who thinks that it's not worth doing, please show them this slide um, where you'll be able to see, you know, if you're not doing responsive emails, you are losing engagement and you are leaving money on the table. So uh, I'll be honest, somehow we didn't, we forgot to ask the question about A-B testing this year, but I'm sure if we did, we would have seen similar results to last year, which is that marketers who are doing A-B testing um, are getting better engagement ra rates. And one of those marketers I'm happy to have here today with me uh, with us is John Wright, another customer of ours from SNHU. And so I'm going to turn things over to John here, and he can, he's going to share what they're doing uh, for email at SNHU. Thanks, Pierce. Hi, everybody. Greetings from Manchester, New Hampshire, Southern New Hampshire University's headquarters. Uh, my name is John Wright. I'm the director of Nurture Marketing here at SNHU and excited to talk to you today about our journey in email, no pun intended, and how we use A-B testing to solve a lot of our problems. So it's always good to start at the beginning. How did we get here? Southern New Hampshire University sends a lot of emails, and our team is primarily responsible for the emails that go out to what we call prospective students or students who aren't students yet. So if you fill out a form on snu.edu, you enter into one of our many nurture marketing email journeys. We send these using Salesforce Marketing Cloud, and we use NAC to create those emails and bring them over into Marketing Cloud and then deploy them. So we have our team structured in a way that I sit side by side with creative professionals, writers and designers. And I'm looking for audiences and segments and good opportunities to communicate and they're looking for ways to creatively stand out in the inbox. New, exciting visual ways to stand out, new, punctual, important content to give them. Um, every student, prospective student or not, needs something from us at every stage in their journey. In the next slide, I, I get into a little bit about how that breakdown works. So everybody loves a funnel slide. Here's one. Um, the funnel on the left is really sort of for everybody's context lead gen hope most folks are comfortable with that um, people coming to the website filling out a form there's a lot of inbound marketing lead gen activity nurture sits right after that so as soon as they fill out the form uh, they're ours until day 15 of their enrollment so until they become students and they have the first couple successful weeks uh, as a student so what we did was we took that middle section of the funnel where we set and over on the right we split out those stages that we knew we had to get them through to become successful students. So those inquiries in the beginning, those leads, or we call them inquiries, we're trying to get them to apply. So ink to app is a big push for us at the beginning part of the journey specifically. So we had 350 emails in flight. We needed to try new things out. 
And the best way to do that in order to know whether something worked or didn't work was to set up A-B tests, and we had to do that at scale. So with 350 to go out and update, we had to do a lot of segmentation within the email journey to do random splits, assign those A and B variants with Salesforce campaigns to see how those prospects did after we sent them the email. So if we're successful at the inquiry stage to get them to apply, the same thing has to happen at the app in progress stage and at the acceptance stage. So if they have an application in place, but we need some documentation from them, some, uh, let's call it a transcript so that everybody can understand <laughs> there's a bunch of different documents we need, but we have to communicate that back to them. And each one of those communications is another touch point to run an A-B test, which is what we did. So every one of those journeys was split 50-50, and the contacts, which come from Salesforce, were assigned these different campaigns, and we could see, okay, email B helped that many students get from the ink to the app stage, become applicants, more than the A variation, let's go with that one, and then iterate, and so on and so forth. So these stages sort of move through success, ink to app, app in progress, accepted students, and then register for classes and have the first couple weeks uh, of successful learning here at SHU. And on this last slide, it's, it's sort of an ethos or a, a methodology we bring to every day at, at Nurture Marketing and, and Marketing Technology here at Southern New Hampshire University. Always be testing. So nobody knows. Hunches are dead. We like to try new things. Let's see how they do. As opposed to the know-it-all in the room or the hippo in the room calling all the shots and saying, I know what works in email marketing. I know what works in this channel. Uh, do this. And, and somebody mentioned stakeholders earlier on in the, in the presentation, sort of bringing their ideas to life, but also testing them against what's there and testing them against other ideas to see what ultimately drove the desired behavior. Um, so all of these emails, although I'll be them very different from one another, are all tested against the original version of this, of this communication to see if these new creative treatments drove more desired behavior than the original version. Over on the left here, we have a congratulations email. This is after you get accepted. Congratulations, Stephanie. There's her program uh, under that yellow action bar there and uh, a term start reminder to say like the next term is coming up on this date, when to get started and a helpful video to make it easy to understand what you can do next. There's also supportive information like, hey, this is a student quote um, you know, you could be just like this, this Alvaro uh, student who has a, a degree in sports management. Wouldn't that be nice one day? Uh, and then more granularly, if we get into that app and progress stage I was talking about, where sometimes we need documentation back and forth, you can see this is a much more text-based email, much more detailed. Uh, what everybody should know about financial aid, it's a tricky subject. There's a lot to it. It's a sensitive subject. Anytime you're talking about funding or money or how people plan on paying for things, it can be difficult to, to have that conversation with students, so lots of testing going on here. And then even more granular than that, when they're engaged with us in this step and submitting a, a FAFSA form, which is a uh, basically a form to see if they can get financial aid from, from colleges, uh, sometimes it's tricky to know which version of it to use and how to get through that and what it looks like on your phone and where to go. Uh, so we try to break down the steps there. So each one of these, the important takeaway here, each one of these is tested against the original version of the email. Uh, and we roll those tests out at scale to try to collect the best overall approach to get people through the funnel. That's awesome. Thanks so much, John, for sharing all that. And, and you talked about, you know, you had hundreds of different emails in these streams. Like, how did you go about scaling that? Like, though, that would be a lot of emails to code by hand or, you know, use sure. templates. How did you do that? Yeah, well, it, it's one of the uh, one of the several reasons we ended up using uh, using Knack was we had creative professionals, designers, and writers who are wonderful. But what we wanted to do is have their beautiful designs and interesting copy and content um, easily be brought into another communication. In fact, we had to do it because to your point, we had 350 to get through. So, um, you know, that sort of uh, interchangeable parts aspect to the modules, you know, in NAC was a real lifesaver for us. Um, but uh, yeah, getting through each one of those and testing it against its original version was not easy. We started with cataloging everything. So the most important thing to know was what 
individual emails were going out at what stage what did they look like today what were the you know the titles of them the names of them the content in them all that stuff and then how many prospects or how many contacts were seeing each one of those so you start to get an idea of low-hanging fruit for the number of contacts going into an email that you think you can do something better for if those two things are pretty great so there's a lot of contacts and we believe we can beat that email that's where we started uh, and so we didn't do it in a linear pattern we did it in order of uh, lowest hanging fruit or biggest impact first and then worked our way through the entire funnel that's awesome thank you so much for sharing i mean it's great to see you know doing testing at that scale and also being able to see it work and see the results um yeah, if you can do it with that many emails, it, it uh, it's pretty impressive. So thank you so much. Um, Thanks, Pierce. All right. So, so just to wrap on this section, so the winning strategies of the create uh, section. So I think it's about finding those unique ways to leverage creativity, use responsive emails, and and like John said, you know, figure out. What is that lowest hanging fruit, maybe the email that you have the most data on and, and making those little changes to see, you know, can you increase that click to open rate a little bit or, you know, reducing the number of calls to action, does that increase uh, over time? And all those little changes lead up to, to a big end result. And so uh, for, the, for this next section, I'll bring in... Uh, my co-founder, Brendan, and we'll go through the collaborate section. Great stuff. Thanks, Pierce. Um, so collaboration. Uh, there was actually a, there was an article in, uh, in the paper recently about a, a collaboration between Apple and Reddit. Um, I read it. Did, did you, you? No? Okay. All right. I'll keep going. So collaboration. What does this have to do with email creation? Uh, a lot, it turns out. This can be a huge blocker for a lot of organizations for winning at email. Collaboration and approvals are actually a key part of the email creation process and can easily become the weakest link in the value chain of your email creation. So approving and collaborating around email are actually two of the top three pain points uh, in, in our study here when marketers were asked about what is slowing them down every day when they create campaigns. Look, I know this is not the sexiest part of email creation or winning at email, right? But it is really important. I hear so often from marketers that they feel like they cannot control this part of the process. Like, how do I speed up someone else's job of approving my emails? Well, that's actually, it's hard to do, but a lot of it comes down to where and how they are approving and collaborating. Is it easy? So we also asked marketers what technology they are using for collaborating. So you can see that there are a, a ton of marketing teams using collaboration platforms like Slack or uh, Microsoft Teams, but test emails are actually right up there. Somebody better tell Slack and Microsoft that uh, test emails are their biggest competitor. Uh, pretty wild. Uh, but I'm sure we've all, all of us on this call uh, have all gotten our fair share of, uh, of test emails landing in our inbox. I remember when that was like 60% of my inbox was just it was a bunch of test emails, right? So whatever the process and tools, it does seem that marketers are absolutely not satisfied with their email creation processes uh, here, uh, or, or excuse me, email approval processes. And we, we've got a lot of work to do here for marketers, it seems. So just to wrap on this collaboration section, uh, marketers are finding collaboration and approvals slow down the process. So uh, a big piece of advice I always talk to marketers about is to treat collaboration and approvals as a real part of the creation process. It isn't a separate process. Your email creation and turnaround time all depend on the collaboration and approval process that is attached to it, right? It's all part and parcel. Uh, so I think the other thing, the last thing here is be deliberate with tool choices here. Make it easy for creators and collaborators uh, and approvers as well, right? To come in and do that quickly and efficiently 
uh, I think being in context and being live collaborating, I think is really key here. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and pass it over to, to Mike. Uh, Mike Rizzo from, from MoPros here. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the findings of his study that he's doing with marketing operations professionals. And he's going to give us a bit of his perspective uh, from a marketing ops uh, perspective sort of thing on email creation. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for putting this uh, event on. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for being a big supporter of the community as always. We appreciate it. Uh, but I'm happy to be here and happy to touch on a few things that we're starting to see in the state of the MoPro research for 2022, uh, which we added, you know, additional questions this year uh, to try to dig into this this topic a little bit. But um, before I get into that, just a quick overview of what the community is all about. I think many of you here uh, are hopefully familiar with the community at this point. But if not, um, we were established in 2017. We have a uh, not quite as many subscribers as some of the guests on this uh, this webinar today have, but we do have a decent number of newsletter subscribers now um, and 2,800 members, many of which uh, span the range of manager up to VP. So there's a lot of learning to do as a community from each other. And if you're looking to sort of advance your career in marketing operations, um, it's definitely one of the places you can go to do that. And then, of course, dig into uh, all the fun stuff around email whether it's B2B or B2C or, or map specific, we have channels for that too. Um, so yeah, let's get into the state of the MoPro survey data. Um, you know, one of the key initiatives of this research is to get a pulse check on what's going on in the landscape of marketing operations professionals. Uh, this particular slide talks about um, those who feel fairly compensated based on their level of experience. And interestingly today, uh, there was a thread going around in our hiring channel about um, transparency around salary. And so this is really important to us, right? We want everybody in the marketing operations space uh, to, to have some validation around their worth. Uh, and so if you haven't yet participated in this research, this is just one of the important sort of missions of, of uh, the actual study itself. I mean, you can see that you know, a decent majority of the pro marketing operations professionals are actually uh, feeling fairly well compensated based on their role. And as you get higher in seniority, that um, that feeling of uh, uh, being fairly compensated actually improves, um, which is which is great. But that probably is just indicative of your level of confidence in going after uh, what it is that you believe your worth is. And so we're all here as a community to tell you you're worth a lot. Um, and and you should uh, you should definitely participate in this research so that we can all um, set some good baselines. So, speaking of baselines, uh, what are MoPros saying in 2022 around whether or not their tech stacks include an email or landing page creation platform? And I I was actually really um, excited by this data. Uh, so far, you know, the survey is going to close in just a couple of days. We have three days left, so. Um, jump in and take it if you haven't yet. But so far, 62% of the folks are saying that they actually already have an email or landing page creation platform as a part of their tech stack, um, which I think is a pretty clear indication that some of the platforms that are out there are a little bit clunky, a little hard to, to deal with. And I think as you sort of bridging off of what you were just sharing, right, um, around sort of the journey to bringing an email to life or even a landing page for that matter, is there's like approval processes and all of these things that you have to go through. Um, you know, these platforms are, are sometimes in the way of that and we need tools in order to enable us uh, to move a little bit faster. And um, I think, you know, on the theme of efficiency and creativity, um, you know, that's what people are investing in, or I should say organizations are investing in. So really interesting data so far around this. And then the next question, uh, we tried to dig in a little bit more specifically Hey, tell us which uh, which potential um, sort of platforms you're already using. It was a it was a check all that apply situation, uh, and so hey, there's NAC sitting up at the top. A uh, few others that are um, that are displayed there. I'm not even familiar with some of these. I actually had to pull the community on some ideas here. Uh, but Unbounce, of course, is a big uh, landing page creation solution, and so um, really interesting, right? Like as people are trying to figure out how to move more efficiently through the journey of creating um, conversion funnels, right? 
um, they're leveraging tools to help them move a little bit faster and maybe do a bit more of that A-B testing. I'm sort of bummed the A-B testing question didn't make it in this year, but uh, I have to agree, Pierce, like you're probably right. The people that are doing A-B testing uh, are probably seeing some better results. Though I always question that um, around email sends because like half the time you send an A-B test and then like, you know, you wait three hours for the results and it's like, well, would I have gotten a better open rate if the winning result would have been sent earlier in the day? Like, or do you wait another day and then send it later, right? Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so I always struggle with that one, even uh, as a community, when we send A-B test emails, I'm like, oh, God, should we just wait? Should the next send go the next day? I'm very confused. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this has all been really yeah. interesting. And I think uh, you know, the operations person in me is always going to question the results of, of A-B tests, but I think that's good. So always be challenging uh, the status quo. So appreciate having me. If anybody has questions on any of this stuff, you can find me in the community, uh, but happy to unpack it further as we go along. Awesome. Yeah, look, thanks. <clears throat> thanks a lot, Mike. That was great. And uh, I just want to say as a active member of your community, uh, as a, you know, uh, an ops guy myself, I, I, you know, I'm really excited about uh, what you're doing for, for marketing ops and and marketing uh, the marketing community as a whole. Uh, I think it's really important. So uh, that's great stuff. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I'll echo that as well. Um, and uh, thanks for being with us, Mike. It's great. Um, so yeah, to to wrap things up here before we get to the Q and A. You know, I think we covered a lot of ground, heard some great perspectives from Stacy, John, and Mike. And uh, I hope all of the data that we shared is helpful for you to, you know, make a business case within your organization or to validate maybe some of the ideas that you might have been having. And I, I would leave everyone with this, which is, you know, when you go back to work and, and look at your email creation process, really looking again at that speed. Are you going as fast as you can? Do we have big obstacles that could make us go a lot faster? And then also on the creativity side, are there areas where you could be more creative, where you could try some of those more advanced design elements to help you really stand out? Um, so, I know I just said we covered a lot of ground. There is so much more in our benchmark, email marketing benchmark report. It's 51 pages that is just jam packed with tons of reports and data, like some of the ones that we saw today, but way more. There is also a bonus section on landing pages. So if you want to know what are the benchmarks for landing pages, make sure you check that out. We will be emailing it to you tomorrow. You know, so you'll we we drink our own champagne here. You guys will receive it in an email. And I know you're all marketers out there. So please critique our email. We'd like to know how we can get better too. Um, you can send those critiques or any questions you might have to hello at knack.com. Please uh, reach out. We are not the type of company where the emails go in a black hole and you never hear from us. We will read and respond to every one of them. So with that, I'd love to invite um, all of our guests uh back online here we got a lot of great questions if you're if you have any other questions please um enter them in the the uh, q a below um as we kind of look up here so there is some uh, a good question here stacy there is a couple of questions for you that came in during your presentation uh tony asked who builds the templates you spoke of? Um, so we have a couple of people who do it. Um, originally, we started out doing it ourselves, and then we actually brought our creative team in and taught them how to use Knack. So we would have our creative director design it, 
and then we would have one of the people that worked on her team actually build it out. So it was an exact replica. Um, I know everybody here works with native teams and they're very, um, you know, move it over to the right and then down and then over and then up and then, oh, now it's perfect, even though it started where it was. So we're not as good at that as they are. So we're like bringing people in who can design. However, I will say that I think that all ops people know what looks good and we know what works well. So we are able to go in and make little tweaks, but we we brought in the creative team to to do the heavy work when when we were getting too many edits in the proofing stage. So awesome! Thanks, uh, thanks, <laughs> Stacy, for sharing that. Uh, John, this is a question for you. Um, what? From Roland, uh, what what would you say has been the most impactful test that you've seen uh, uh, drive click rates? Oh, it's a great. There's actually, it brings up an interesting topic. So our A/B tests are set up in such a way to test how many people actually apply from our emails, not just click or open them. Uh, we do have some that that check for clicks, uh, for sure. Uh, but the easiest ones to run for click rate test optimizations are CTA language tests. So like just changing the word on the button or the color on the button or the position on the button. Uh, and I say button singular, but usually there's a second button that ends up sneaking into our, to our emails. But those, those are the most successful ones we've seen uh, for click rate improvement. Uh, though a lot of our, our A-B tests, like I said, are, are set up to drive uh, improvement on app rates uh, or, or behavioral rates. But uh, I'd start with buttons. Nice. Yeah, nice. one uh, one that I can share as well. So, you know, um, when when you're sending out a test uh, like a text only email, uh, one that we had a lot of success with was we actually we actually put in sent from my iPhone at the bottom of the text only email. And that really dramatically changed how many people would actually reply to that email because it just added that other layer of kind of authenticity. We are marketing to marketers, so you know, you everyone out there knows all the tricks. We have, have to be sort of one ahead, but that that is one that we have seen some really good success on. I'm going to try sent from my iPad next time and see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Yeah, Brianna has a good question here. What is the ideal number of CTAs for newsletters? This is a good question, Brianna. I think um, there's a lot of different uh, perspectives on newsletters and things. Does anyone want to, John or, or Stacy, chime in on that? Or. Mike? Mike, I you know what I was just literally going to go pull up my data in our new because we do send a once a month newsletter um, and it's got a ton of options to click through, uh, but I think I don't know what the optimal number is uh, to be honest with you, Brianna. Um, but what I will say is the consistency with which you deliver the newsletter into sections really helps. Right, so people know what to expect, uh, and maybe you mix it up and add in sort of a new module in the middle or something like that. But like, what we found, at least in the MoPros sort of newsletter efforts, uh, is that by consistently offering sort of the same set of content that rarely changes, now people know that they can open up that newsletter and that section that they always care about is probably always located somewhere, you know at the bottom or at the top or what have you, which really does help drive the, the click-through rate um, for us. So for what it's worth, consistency was key in what we learned about the, the newsletter sends, but yeah. Yeah, for us, it was keeping the, um, the copy, not so much around the CTAs, but keeping the copy within the sections small so that people actually did want to click through. And we've got um, some of our newsletters have like up to 12 or 13 different modules that are leading to typically um, articles that are on some sort of like a journal website. And so we have to be very specific about like 
what the CTA is, but for us, we just keep it, you know, very concise with an image, a little bit of copy and that CTA and um, it seems to work. We get, we get really good results on all of those newsletters. And I think it has to do with the design because it's so clean and it always looks the same every time. I would have loved if, if Mike and Stacy, if you had just said three and then left it there. As the <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't know. To be honest with you, there's, uh, there's, I, I just look, because <laughs> I would have just said, yeah, what, what they said, what they said. Um, I wish. Yeah. I mean, look, yeah. Looking at a if bunch I had of my ours, way, <laughs> yeah, they don't listen to us. What do we know? <laughs> Yeah, I was just scanning through like you guys were scanning through looking for a, a magic number and it's all over the place. Some have one, some have three, some have five. I don't know. It's a great question. Uh, and yeah. newsletters, I think, is a, is a hidden thing in there. It, it kind of depends on uh, what is the what is the genesis of the email or the communication? What are you trying to do? If it's like a team update or a newsletter or company update or something like that, probably less. If it's a marketing email, commercial email, trying to incentivize some sort of behavior or click, you can probably get away with more. Stacey, I love what you said about modules instead of CTAs, just calling it like topics almost. Whereas if there's like, if there's yeah. enough content there to justify it, that kind of works. But I think we've all been in those uh, workshop yeah. sessions where it's just add a button, add a button, add a button, add a button. You gotta, oh. Well, and it's, it's hard great... because you're typically building it for someone else and there are there are political reasons around things that you're creating right and so it's like what hill do you want to die on so you just try to make and it look it, the best you can it's like here's 27 ctas good luck <laughs> and i think you know again it all kind of comes back to what we we're saying with the testing and optimizing is I don't think any of us can just stand here and, and give you a number. I think if you look at the actual stats, you know, one CTA is going to get you technically the best conversion rate. But at the same time, when we talk about newsletters, you know, there's so much great content. I, I would say, like, look at your content. Do you have, like, four incredible pieces of content to put in front of your subscribers well go with four and maybe leave out the ones that aren't as strong but that just going back to that testing component and test you know test five test ten and see how that uh, impacts your conversion yeah I, I like what john said earlier hunches are dead right john this is all about data now <laughs> <laughs> this is a safe space otherwise i can't say that kind of stuff <laughs> john, john when i was um i don't know let's just say super early in my career uh i i definitely tweeted out at some point that like data um you know data removes hippos and you made a reference to hippos in your presentation right the highest paid person's opinion um and so I, I just, I chuckled when you shared that because I was like, yes, like someone else is championing these things. Safe space, safe space, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just us on here today, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So awesome. Well, this, I, I have loved the, the discussion here. Thank, thank you to everybody who uh, submitted questions and joined us today. I hope I hope everybody is walking away with at least one good takeaway um, from today's session. Uh, but if you and and one other call out I want to give is if you contributed to the email benchmark study as well, thank you. Like we couldn't do this without everybody's contributions. So. Thank you for joining. Thank you all of our speakers for joining today. And uh, we will talk to everyone soon. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Thank you.